Welcome everyone to the Is Observable channel, first of all, and to the second edition of the Observable Lightning Talks. So, first of all, you may ask yourself, what is the Observable Lightning Talks? Well, very simple. The main idea is to get the thought leaders, the experts, the innovators to uh, the uh, this live stream for an hour or a bit more, uh, where they can share tips and recommendations or methods uh, to you guys on specific topics. And this channel covers three topics, as you may know, observability in general, so Prometheus or any open source, open observability framework, uh, anything related to open telemetry, and last, anything related to SRE, so chaos engineering, automations, uh, SLI, SLO, and you name it. So how does it work? Very simple. For this, I will have three speaker covering those three topics, like it explained. And each of those speakers has a challenge of speaking for 15 minutes. So it's going to be three lightning talks. The Q&A, we don't have time. So don't worry if you have questions, you still have the time to express yourself. Because at the end, we will end up with a panel discussion uh, where I will ask questions probably from those presentations because I'm here to learn. And if you have any questions, of course, note them and drop them uh, in your chat, in YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook, whatever you're connected. So then I can, we can ask the questions uh, during the panel discussion. So tonight, tonight, today, in this uh, Observable Lightning Talks, I have three great speakers. The first is going to be Eduardo Silva. So uh, he is, for those who never heard about Eduardo, Eduardo Silva is the uh, the founder uh, of Friendbit, which is a project donated to CNCF, and he also uh, the founder of a company called Calyptia. The second presentation will be Mandy Walls, uh, that will show us on speaking more about SRE automation. So you know, you know, in automation you have removing toil, but uh, you will need obviously to have smart automation, and she's going to uh, deliver some tips about this. Last, we will have uh, Jurassi. Uh, so Jurassi, for those who never heard about Jurassi, Jurassi is uh, an engineer working at Grafana Labs, but also is, is a maintainer on the Open Turning Project. He's, part, he's been part of also the, the government's community board, so he's very involved in Open Turning Project, so we're very excited to have a presentation related to the Open Telemetry Collector. So I'm not going to reveal too much, so we'll let uh, 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 Jurassi talk about more. So without waiting anymore, let's uh, start with Eduardo. Hello. Hey. hey, Henry, how are you? Very good. Welcome, Eduardo. Welcome. How are you? Yeah, doing good, doing good. Very excited about this opportunity. This 15 minutes for a lightning talk is very challenging, but uh, I hope that I can share insight tips and information uh, for observability users or new people getting into this uh, space. So uh, Eduardo, like mentioned, is the one of the uh, the, the creator of, of Renbit. Uh, also, for those who never heard about uh, the monkey server, uh, we talked, we had a discussion and I discovered that you created the, the project from that. And he's going to talk about uh, logs, traces, and metrics. And if you have never heard about it, Fluent Beach recently, Fluent Beach V2, since KubeCon Detroit supports metrics, traces, and logs. So that's very exciting. So without talking a bit more, I would like to leave the stage to Eduardo so you can walk through uh, your presentation. So good luck and see you in 15 minutes. Awesome. Thank you. So I will start uh, sharing my screen. Uh, let me place everything here. So this lightning talk uh, is very much an intro about uh, how do we see observability or how do we manage specifically telemetry data in the Fluent Bit project. Uh, an intro about me was just provided, so I'm pretty much going to skip this, this deck. And I'm going to talk about a bit of about the complexity of the telemetry data. Let, let's get a step back around what are the problems that we're solving. The whole goal of telemetry data that we are collecting in general is not because it's cool to have data. Actually, the final goal is to perform data analysis and make sure that business can take the better decisions. But when we want to analyze data or take good decisions, right, we need to start thinking about our telemetry data. 
And one of the complex or the challenges around is that data come from multiple sources, different formats. And at some point nowadays, we need to correlate the data all together. And in the telemetry data, uh, from our perspective, we're going to focus just on logs, metrics, and traces. All of them uh, serve for different but also similar uh, purposes or different angles to look at what's happening in our environment with our applications and with our services or systems in general. Logs pretty much are used as like the most, the oldest uh, way to collect information from application. They pretty much ship some information about the status, errors, and we can find this on user level applications, on services, but also, for example, in the kernel, right? If I'm putting my system, I want to understand uh, how the kernel is operating or if there's any error. Yeah, my first command will be the message, which will read the key message device uh, from the profile system, right? So logs has been there for many, many years. And I would say uh, we can try to kill them, but I would say they're always useful for troubleshooting and understand the space. In the other, in the other angle, as part of this telemetry data, Metrics also are a quite important piece because metrics give us a specific data points, numeric data points that help us to understand behaviors from applications. Logs are more kind of human readable messages, while metrics, you, we can interpret what's going on with this uh, application based on the metrics that are being collected or exposed by the application. And metrics types, we have counters, gauges, histogram, and summaries. All of this from a very agnostic view in, in the ecosystem. And in the other place, we have traces. And traces are quite really, really interesting because nowadays we don't have kind of monolithic applications. We have distributed applications. And at some point, if you get one request to one service and that service needs to talk to other pieces, other services, at some point, you want to troubleshoot and understand where the problems are, where is the delay latency, or any other kind of questions around a performance or around weird behaviors, right? And from an implementation traces, right, most of the time requires that you instrument your application. And when you instrument the application, you have the concept of spans, attributes. And also, there is something really, really new. They have seen some open source projects around where Despite tracing uh, by nature requires that you instrument your application, there are external ways to do tracing in applications without instrumenting the application, right? Uh, maybe you have heard about eBPF, and may, I would like to have another talk about that later. Is that with eBPF, you can take a look what kind of uh, operations or calls every application is doing at a kernel level. But if a user space application is doing some TCP connection, right, you can read that from the kernel by using eBPF and you can generate traces too. That is quite interesting, but maybe for uh, another time. And talking now about what are the industry standards, I think that this is a, a really important topic because it means what companies are deploying and using today as a standard versus uh, what are their other options that they have in the market? And, and this is sometimes a very uh, confusing topic, right? Pretty much because there's many options, there are many uh, solutions to achieve the same goal. But when we say industry standard, it's pretty much when just majority of companies are vouching or using one technology for a specific uh, problem that they want to solve. In logs, you might see if you have a Linux box, our syslog will be there. It's like in the standard service to, to collect the system messages uh, or you know ship them out of the box. No matter if you have system D, our syslog will be there. But also our syslog is quite limited in terms of it just talk to our syslog. It just speak the syslog protocol. But what about when you want to connect your data or send it to a different vendor that speaks a different protocol like HTTP or gRPC, right? Uh, we talk about multiple sources, multiple formats, and the same probably happen with in the output side with multiple destinations and different types of uh, connectivity, compression, or different kind of features that every backend needs. So in order to move the data, the industry is pretty much standard for logs on moving the data with FluentD and FluentBit projects. That's what we found nowadays. In the metrics side, uh, the industry is pretty much aligned uh, on Prometheus. 
And well, in the past, people used to just use Nagios or NetData or other kind of application to collect telemetry data. And Prometheus was kind of a really interesting uh, story around it that was created at SoundCloud. And just maybe a tip, <laughs> yes, about, I didn't thought about this, but CNCF just released, a, sorry, Honeycomb just released an, a documentary around the Prometheus project story, which is really cool. You will find it for free in YouTube. And, and Prometheus, getting back to the session, <laughs> Prometheus allows you to collect metrics, process them, store them, and you know you can query the data and extract value from it. And from the traces perspective, yeah, the industry today is running on open telemetry. Uh, for people who was following CNCF or previous projects around it, you might remember open tracing and open census that both projects merged together and gave you know, a new life to open telemetry, which aims to solve all the problems around data movement and processing for logs metrics and traces. So as a open telemetry as a framework and libraries and services, nowadays the industry is aligned in using open telemetry mostly for traces, while metrics and logs are still you know, evolving from an adoption uh, standpoint. So we might see some huge adoption around open telemetry within the next two years. Remember that all these technologies uh, take some time to, to deploy in production. And the challenges with telemetry we have is like, it's not just about sources or multiple formats. It's also, it's like every company is generating every year around 30% more data than the previous year. And you might imagine that if you have infrastructure or your, your, your layers to, to do telemetry and move the data around, if next year you would have 30% more, you need a strategy. You need a, a way to handle that load because you will get many issues. When moving data or processing data, you get back pressure, you, you face failure scenarios because this happens every single day. The thing is that the tools behind this job needs to be prepared to handle that. And also there's one interesting topic about performance. And performance also is about speed, how fast I can process the data, how fast I can ship the data. But there's one topic that a uh, few people talk about it. I can achieve high speed, but what is the cost of that speed? And I'm talking about resources usage, right? So when thinking about all these challenges and potential solutions and thinking about performance, always think about speed and how what will be the cost of that speed. Your car could be really, really fast, but it depends on how much gas it's going to consume, right? In software, it's the same around CPU cores and CPU usage, which has a cost at the end of the day. And Fluentbit borns as a solution to solve all these challenges around performance, telemetry data in a very efficient way. Uh, Fluentbit is a project that was born in 2015, is fully written in C language, and is part of the Fluentd project, and it has also graduated status with the CNCF, so Apache license and fully um, available if you want to give it a try. Fluentbit started as a log agent only, and one, two years ago, we started extending the scope of the agent to support metrics and traces. And you might think, hey, but if industry is aligned with Prometheus, if the industry is aligned with uh, open telemetry for traces, why you extended the scope? The thing is that one of the philosophy of the Fluentbit project is not to be a drop-in replacement. Actually, is to integrate with other ecosystems. Now, who use Fluentbit today? Major cloud providers. If you deploy a Kubernetes cluster or on AWS, Microsoft, Google Cloud, you will find Fluentbit in there. Also, Splunk contributes back to Fluentd and Fluentbit. Walmart deploys this uh, heavily. VMware, Cisco, LinkedIn. And as a telemetry agent, one of the important pieces, as I said, is not to be a drop-in replacement, but actually in a way to integrate a other system like Prometheus and open telemetry. There's no way that one single uh, agent or solution will rule, rule out all your production environment, but always we need to find a way to integrate uh, all of them. And Fluentbit has been a successful uh, use case for that. Fluentbit, from a pipeline perspective, allows you to collect data from different sources to multiple and send it to multiple destinations. So you can collect data from Prometheus, send it to OpenTelemetry, to Kafka, Splunk, or collect syslog. Actually, it's very well integrated with Kubernetes uh, ecosystem. 
So we have just like four minutes for a hands-on demo. So I'm going to prioritize one specific demo that will be more uh, useful for you around data. The most basic one is like, we're going to collect as a log agent, we're going to process some Nginx access log, right? And I'm going to visualize them in a, in a tool that is called, it's new, it's open source, it's called Parsable. So I'm going to start sharing my terminal here. For example, in the terminal, I'm going to run everything from the command line. You can see here, we have the access log from Nginx. And with Fluembed, what I'm going to do is to just start collecting the logs from that file and ship this information to Parsable, which Parsable is just an external service that I deploy locally in my computer. And the way that it works is pretty simple. I'm going to write Fluembed and give it a configuration. And at some point, just the data will be ingested into the platform. If we go to Parsable UI, you will see that the data is just available. But notice something here. All the data in the log, yeah, this is what you read from the terminal, but it doesn't follow a structure. What about if we can give it a structure with Fluembed? So I'm going to go to the Fluembed configuration and I'm going to enable the parser. So as soon as the data gets into in the pipeline, I'm going to apply the Nginx parser and I'm going to convert this raw data into a real structure format that will allow you to have a more a better understanding of your data by querying the data by columns. As you can see, here's the old data and the new one is just a split across columns because we created a structure for the data. So now you can take a look at data based on code, based on method or paths that in the service was serving. And as a second, as a second I'm scripting, I might skip this one second demo uh, to talk about metrics. Uh, I told you that um, Plumbit can generate metrics. Actually, one of the interesting features that we have is called, uh, you might be familiar with Prometheus Node Exporter, which is a way to collect metrics from the host and make them available. So I'm going, we have the same functionality inside Plumbit by using the node export and metrics plugin. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect from Nodex the host metrics and I'm going to expose them to a, an output plugin that mimics Prometheus Exporter. So I'm going to here just split my pen here and I'm going to, sorry, I'm running this it's in, a, in a VM. MCTL, share, monops. I don't want to touch. Oh, what's wrong? Line CTL. Oops. Okay, I'm going to stop this one. I'm going to query the data. By using curl, I'm going to grab the information that Fluembit on this pane is generating. And here you will find all the Prometheus metrics that were collected in the other side. Since we have just one minute left, I'm going to just jump into the final demo, which is a, a, a here I'm going to demonstrate in how a Java apps is shipping open telemetry metrics plus open telemetry traces. And Fluembit is able to get this data, send it to Jagger. Also, one Prometheus is scraping the metrics, but also is sending the data to open telemetry, and we have Grafana connected. I'm going to start my Docker Compose because this was running here before. I hope that the restart doesn't mess it up things. And here I have the Grafana dashboard, which is pretty much starting collecting the data. Yeah, the first data point just show up. And also here I have the Jigger interface. Remember that we have this diagram here where I'm sending the sample traces. These are just random data. Doesn't, it's not a like a real, here you will find the information. In the span. It's not like a full correlated data. This is like a small fluent bit demo for observability that connects with metrics, uh, with traces, and with logs. And as canon of the of the next, and just to finish the last slide in 30 seconds, fluent bit 2.1 is coming out now on April 15. And one of the three major features is log metadata support fluent bit. We are going to support hot reload and more performance uh, improvements. Awesome. 
thanks, Eduardo. Uh, so uh, for those who never heard about Flintbit, so here is the, the QR code to uh, jump to the flintbit.io website. Documentation is amazing. And by the way, uh, tomorrow I'm releasing an episode on Flintbit uh, v2. Uh, where I will, uh, and to next Tuesday, uh, I will release a tutorial on how to collect metrics, logs, and traces that, that you just showcased to us. So if you want to have a tutorials and, and use the open temperature demo with a friend bit, be patient, it will be released next Tuesday. So thanks, Eduardo, for uh, this presentation. Uh, very interesting. And I have noted some questions. So if you, if you have questions, remind, I'm just reminding that there's a panel discussion at the end where you can ask your questions. So without waiting more, let's jump to the second uh, talk with Mindy. Hey, Mindy. Hey. How are you? All right. How are you? Very good. So by the way, where are you connected from? I'm in New Jersey in the United States today. So. OK. So uh, but uh, as a DevOps uh, uh, advocate, I guess you're traveling around the globe to Absolutely. present and we're share at, news. Yeah, we were at scale last week. I was at um, Config Management Camp earlier in February. And I will be at WTF as SRE in London in May. So lots cool. of interesting places. So Mandy is going to talk about uh, uh, SRE topic because uh, she's come from PagerDuty. So you expect probably some SRE related topics. Uh, and here it's about automation. I mentioned automation is great, but uh, a powerful automation is better. Yes. So let's, I'll leave you the stage to you, Mandy, so you can you can share your tips about automation. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thanks for the intro. I am Mandy Walls. Uh, I am a DevOps advocate at PagerDuty. You can get in touch with me on LNXHK on the socials, or you can email me always. I'm mwalls at pagerduty.com. Love to talk to folks about stuff and things all the time, right? So um, I'm going to talk broadly about automation and complex environments and, and that kind of stuff. But I want to start with like a little bit of a story that we sometimes see with some of our customers, right? So I have a developer. Her name is... Alice, she works on a microservice that's, you know, part of her company's customer facing applications. And one of the requirements for her engineering team is that before things go into the big honk and build pipeline, they do some sanity checking, but the environment's a little too complex for just like running on their desktops. So the developers want to get a sanity check environment in the cloud. And if you work in a large enough organization, the chances are that just anybody can log into the cloud account and request an environment. So it's to get pretty rare, right? Like things get kind of bolted down and access gets restricted. So Alice, in our example, doesn't have direct access to the cloud account because it's all held by somebody else. So she puts a request in, right? She has a, there's a ticket queue, maybe it's in Jira or wherever it lives, right? So she puts a ticket in and it goes to the cloud operations team and eventually it'll get handled. It's in there with a bunch of other requests from a bunch of other teams. Now there's a subtask for Alice's ticket, right? And the new FinOps team is now sitting there and they're like, we gotta keep up with how much everybody is spending on the cloud, right? Because it gets to be a lot. So her ticket goes to FinOps. They take a look at what's going on in the account. Maybe the dev team has too many environments already. Maybe they've overspent their budget for the quarter and maybe they'll refuse her ticket. But if FinOps approves her ticket, it just proceeds to cloud ops and they do their magic and eventually Alice gets her environment. But this is all super clunky, right? We want to make sure that all the boxes are checked when Alex requests a new environment, but do we really need to have a bunch of people involved, right? Should it really even take time? We started using the cloud event originally because it was like super quick and you felt like you could just like run your credit card across the bottom of your monitor and get everything that you needed. So like all of this delay and requests and like doing all this stuff feels like a big step backwards, but definitely is starting to happen in a lot of organizations. They have these complex requirements. There's like compliance and security and financial guidelines that everyone wants to adhere to. But like Alice doesn't care about any of that stuff. She just wants to get back to work and ship awesome stuff for the customers. 
So all the folks in our example have goals, they have responsibilities and things that they are accountable for. They have different products and services that they're permitted to have access to. And maybe they're completely different. Like when I log into our SSO account, like there's a whole bunch of applications there that I've access to that I don't know what they are, what they do, but they're there, right? There's just a lot of them. Um, but most of all these folks have specific expertise for their roles, right? But how much knowledge and expertise ends up getting shared among different teams starts to vary from organization to organization. We're definitely small organizations have little teams. And it's like, there's the IT folks, they're over there on that side and that Zoom call or that Slack channel. And they do all the stuff and they write the applications and they manage the infrastructure and they do the security and all those things. But as the organization grows and the services and the things that they provide become more complex, you start to find natural places where you can like start to crease the paper a little bit and say, okay, well, these folks have, you know, these skills and folks start to build up like a sphere of influence based on some kind of important work that they're doing, right? And our technical organization, the development team isn't permitted to directly provision assets in the main cloud accounts. And that's, you know, what happens. The organization has these requirements around the ability to log in and deploy limited to just the folks on the cloud ops team. And those folks have tools at their disposal. Maybe they've written them in house. Maybe they come from a vendor. Maybe they've, they're from Stack Overflow, you know, wherever they find them. But those tools has to be run and managed by cloud ops in order to meet the rest of the constraints that the organization has put on the use of the cloud. But these teams all know their stuff. They have enough stuff of their own, though, to keep them busy, right? It's challenging for teams to completely cross train everyone in the org on all the tasks and all the different pieces in the environment. So unfortunately, we start to see then a, a sort of re siloing of um, expertise of skills and of tasks that we used to see in the bad old days, right? When people didn't talk to each other and like things just kind of got thrown around. But now we're looking at sort of skill silos because of all this challenge and all the things that people need to know about, right? So when we take a look at what we want out of say automation and the ability to delegate automation, we're looking at sort of branching through all of these teams and reaching out to all these folks and giving them what they need to get their jobs done. So not waiting on us, right? So there's definitely benefits to automation and hopefully you've got automation in your organization and you've, you start to reap some of these rewards, right? You've got these, we want to tame these modern IT systems that we have. There's all this stuff going on and like you've got your cloud infrastructure and you've got containers and hosts and networks and monitoring and collecting metrics and alerting systems and log collection and all the great open telemetry and all that great stuff too right? There's just all this stuff running around. And that doesn't even get to what is required to actually run the applications. There's a whole other basket of things you need there. You want your services to be up and running and they have to be communicating with any number of other services in order to be useful. And like maintaining that complexity is a lot of cognitive load, right? When we have all these different components, then we're, especially if we work in a, a, an open source environment, like they change all the time, right? The third party services, they get changed whenever the developers decide they want to, right? So we wanna be in a place where we wanna keep up with that change or conversely, lock down our environment so we're not like surprised by change when it comes through, right? Um, so we also want to get to a place where we're reducing our own mistakes, right? It's easy to make mistakes when we've got a lot of manual processes, right? Especially if it's got lots of steps. You can imagine like copying, pasting line after line after line out of a wiki page somewhere, or they've got like really, really long commands and you're like, oh, you dropped the last one off by accident and then you have no idea what you got out of it at the end, right? So there's just plenty of these things that we can help us put them into a little package and save them. And finally, toil. We know toil is a four letter word, right? It's the fancy R SRE speak for like getting rid of the boring stuff that we know we have to do, sort of the hygiene things that have to get done. And we wanna give that to automation so that we don't have to do it with the humans, right? Because they have other things to do. Unfortunately, as we approach this kind of place, We've got lots of folks who have lots of things they might need, right? I've got my SRE teams, I've got support, or maybe I've, 
have a, re a release engineering team. We've got developers and DBAs. They all need to have maybe some access or query ability into the cloud. But then you've got like the cloud ops folks who really are the only ones with the access there, right? So we've got to sort of get to a place where we can bridge the gap between giving these folks access to things they're kind of not allowed to have, but also need for their day-to-day -day jobs, right? Various teams end up building tools that help their workflow sort of get around all of this stuff. And we approach it as sort of looking at what we call uh, gaps in the components, right? And the first part is a knowledge gap. Like our developers know their stuff, right? They are working in whatever their programming languages, they know the runtimes, libraries, all that great stuff. But like, that doesn't mean they know absolutely everything there is to know about the cloud and they shouldn't need to, right? So they may not know exactly where we're deployed, what kind of images we're using, any of that kind of stuff. We also might have a skills gap, right? Who really wants to go through weeks and weeks of training to learn whatever infrastructure provider we're using just to deploy their stuff? Like that seems like a waste of their time. And then the access gap is a huge one, right? Just getting to a place where folks can uh, access things that are locked down or that we have compliance around is another whole speed bump in the road to just getting things out the door. I, we kind of think of this as like a, a 100% problem, something that, that Adam Jacob kind of coined. And like, you're looking at what you know to do your job and you kind of know 100% of the things that are in there. Maybe you don't know absolutely everything, but you've got a pretty good handle on that sort of sphere of stuff. But like, so does every other team. And if you need to join them up, well, then you're expecting someone to know sort of 200% of what they need to know. And that's not a good way to look at it, right? We don't want folks to, to have to learn absolutely everything. So we can take a look at taking our internal automation and putting it together in a way that makes it a bit more self-service. And what I mean by that is that I want Alice to just be able to say, hey, I need this, uh, this um, environment in the cloud account and it just happens right just gonna wait for tickets doesn't wait for internal slas or any of that stuff she can hit the button and get what she needs out of it so we're when we're thinking about self-service automation we're thinking about it in a way that is also software design and software development practices and all that kind of great stuff right so we want to think about you know, where does Alice normally work? Are, are our engineering teams, are they good on the command line? Some folks really are. They're super used to working in the terminal. Other folks, not so much. They're more familiar with uh, UIs or working in an IDE or other constraints, whatever that looks like. So we want to be aware of how they're working and what's going to keep them in their flow, right? So they're not waiting around for things. And then we want to provide results that make sense. No one wants to like hit a button somewhere and just have an error box pop up that gives them no knowledge, right? So if Alice wants to request an environment and it turns out that her team has spent more than their budget in the cloud, it should report that back to her, right? It says your team is over budget, please contact your manager or whatever the resolution is for that, right? And then we want to provide a consistent experience. There's nothing worse than having like a set of internal tools that like one person has decided that all of the options should be like a hyphen and then a single character. And another person has decided, well, we're gonna do only two hyphens and the long word for the options. People get so confused and expect things to work both ways. And then you've got like unnecessary complexity for no real reason, right? So having some constraints and a little bit of a product management hat on there is really gonna help folks get to a place where they can be self-sufficient, right? And then we wanna include documentation in context. No one wants to like be in the UI or be on the command line and then have to like refer to the wiki or go to somewhere else to find what's going on there. We wanna keep folks, like I said, in the flow, working as efficiently as possible and not just stumbling over our internal tools because we haven't put them together in a way they understand. So when we're looking to adapt automation for delegation, we want to make sure that we're standardizing things for options, for actions, for naming, right? Like making sure that things kind of make sense that way. It has the team name in it or the environment name. Uh, put things together like you would for an API. Have them be predictable. Have them have common results, the way things come back in a certain format and they act like building blocks, right? And they want them to be secure, whether that requires hooking them up with our 
uh, enterprise SSO or whatever other kind of authentication or access control we have. That's great, makes it super easy for everyone. They click that chiclet and off it goes. And But also some auditability, right? If Alice is going to go in and request a uh, an environment in the cloud today, I want to know that, hey, there's a new environment there and it pops up and it was assigned to Alice. I don't necessarily have to know that in real time, but I want a list of it somewhere that I, I can go back and refer to if I need to like write a report on who's using the environment. So we can start to think about the stuff that we have and what can be automated and what's good to automate and surface for folks that we don't want to get in the way of, right? And since PagerDuty is kind of, you know, in the incident response space, uh, our first look at this is sort of in the incident response lens, because I don't want to have to call more responders into my incident for an application problem because I can't access logs, because I can't look at the telemetry, because I can't get the performance data out of the environment. All those things are great first pieces for saying, oh, here is a packet of delegated automation for you. We know you don't have access to all of these things, but we use the system account that does and put it together for you. So eventually we get to the point where Alice is able to click the button, request her stuff and get her environment back, right? And that makes it great for absolutely everyone. If you'd like to know more about how PagerDuty sort of approaches this, we have a product called Rundeck that takes this kind of tack for you. And there's an open source version we would love to have you participate with. And there's more documentation available at pagerduty.com and rundeck.com. And if you really want to read the whole thing in long form, we have a whole ops guide for you at autoremediation.pagerduty.com, and uh, as well as some workshops and some code and some other pieces. We'd love to have you try it out. So thanks. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Mindy. Uh, I already noted some few questions about uh, your presentation. Excellent. Uh, but I will, uh, I will probably ask them uh, later on during the panel discussion. So same thing, Perfect. just remind. If you have any questions related to uh, Mandy's presentation, note them down and we will have a dedicated panel discussion where we're going to take your questions. So thanks, Mandy. Yes, thanks. And uh, let's jump to uh, the last presenter of today, uh, which is Jurassic. Hello. Hey. Hi, <laughs> Hi, Jurassic. How are you? Hey, very good. How about you? I'm super good. I mean, uh, so far so good. The the live stream goes well. No technical issues. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. where were you? Where you're connected today? Um, I'm speaking from São Paulo or close to São Paulo city in Brazil. Yeah, right, it's so a city you... called São José dos Campos, so it's very close to São Paulo. <laughs> All right. So for anyone connected to Brazil uh hi from there and uh so uh, for those who's uh, working with open telemetry uh eduardo mentioned the open telemetry project uh you may probably have used i'm pretty sure the collector uh, so uh, <laughs> there's lots of various versions of the collector from various vendors or on the community level and Jurassic is gonna walk through on how you can build your own collector distro so yeah, without absolutely. waiting more i'll let you leave you the stage uh, to you all right thank you um uh indeed you've, you've hopefully used uh, the collector um and um this conversation here today is on how to build your own open telemetry collector distribution with ocb so ocb stands for open telemetry collector builder and uh, we are going to have a um uh we're going to i'm going to explain to you what uh, open telemetry collector builder is but uh, before that, I would like to talk a little bit about what is the Open Telemetry Collector. So just give a quick introduction to the collector. Um, what are some of the concepts behind the Open Telemetry Collector? And um, I'm going to talk about distributions more specifically. So what is a distribution in the context of Open Telemetry Collector? Now, then we focus on the Open Telemetry Collector Builder project. And um, uh, I'm going to explain to you what the Open Telemetry Collector Builder is. I'm going to give you an example. And uh, I'm going to run a demo at the end. So at the end of this uh, 15 minutes, we should, uh, you should be able to uh, understand what the builder is, when to use it, and how to get your own distribution done. So um, open telemetry collector. So we, for those who haven't heard about the collector yet, uh, the collector is a vendor agnostic way to receive, process, and export telemetry data. And since um, you can go to opentelemetry.io slash docs slash collector to get more information about the collector itself. 
No, um, there are some things that I uh, that I need you to, or that we need to be on the on in sync. Um, in and those are some of the collector concepts. So we have a concept of a receiver, processor, and exporter. And a receiver is a component as part of the collector that uh, is respons responsible for obtaining the telemetry data point, either actively, like in a pole model, or passively, like in a push model. Right? So perhaps you have a, a Prometheus receiver and that works by, by pulling data out of your workloads, or perhaps you have an open telemetry receiver or OTLP receiver that opens a TCP port and listens for incoming data. We have a, a, a concept, of, the concept of processor. So we have um, processors with the ability to look into, this data, into the telemetry data that is in the pipeline and they may potentially change the in-flight telemetry data points. For instance, we may want to uh, do some, some PII, so personally identifiable information cleanup. So perhaps the source of the data contains some information that we do not want to include or we do not want to store on the data database, or perhaps there's some data that we want to transform in some way. So we can use processors for that. And then at the other side of the pipeline, we have exporters. And I think it's kind of obvious what exporters are, but um, they are components that get telemetry data out of the collector, right? So again, either passively, like in a pole model or actively in a push model. Note that they are inverted uh, from the receivers. So passively here, that means pole model, like I'm exposing a slash matrix endpoint and expect someone to pull this data from me. Or I have, uh, I, I actively export data by making a, a perhaps a TCP connection somewhere to send this data to. Right, so those are three of the main uh, basic components that we have for the collector. We also have two other types of, of components. One is uh, the extension. So the extension is not part of the pipeline. It, an extension is a component that interacts with the collector, not with the data points. Right? So uh, they, they don't, don't interact directly with the data that is flowing through the pipeline. So they might be health check extensions or authentication or authorization extensions and things like that. Now, we have another type of, of component, and um, we I, I'm not quite sure that we talked publicly about this one here. Um, I know that we're going to have a session about connectors during the Observability Day in um, during the KubeCon week, uh, but I, I'm not quite sure that we talked publicly about connectors yet. So a connector, for those who don't know, uh, and I... I think most of you don't know, so let's 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 go ahead. <laughs> a component is a um, is an exporter in one pipeline and is a receiver in another pipeline, so that you can transform one signal into another, perhaps, or you can just connect two pipelines together. So imagine that you have um, a a logs pipeline, and you want to extract metrics out of those logs. So you have a logs exporter. And, or you have a connector in the logs pipeline and you have a connector on a metrics pipeline. So you can transform logs into metrics and then uh, export, export those metrics as part of a regular metrics pipeline, right? Another use case is um, like span through metrics instead of logs through metrics, or perhaps we can extract the span events that are within the spans and extract them into logs. Right? But the idea is a connector, again, is an exporter in one pipeline and the receiver in another pipeline. And they might be of the same type or may, they might be of different types. Now, this is the mental model of the collector or the conceptual architecture. Uh, this is available on opentelemetry.io, the documentation. So go to docs and then collector and you'll see this, this image in there. Um, and on the left hand side, you can see some receivers like the OTLP, Jaeger and Prometheus receivers. On the right hand side, you see exporters like the TLP again, Jaeger again, and Prometheus again. So um, in, on, on, on the left hand side, we are emulating a Jaeger or a Prometheus server, or a scraper, and a Jaeger server. Um, and on the right hand side, we are sending data to Jaeger and sending data or making data available to Prometheus. In between those two uh, uh, parts, so like receivers and exporters, we have processors. And at the very top, we have the extensions. And in yellow here, we have a traces pipeline. And in green, we have a metrics pipeline. So we, we can have the collector having two pipelines, one for metrics, one for, for, for traces. Um, and perhaps we're using the same extensions, the same uh, processors, in, in, so that we can get a consistent treating of, of the data that is flowing through the pipeline. All right, so um, that's the collector. 
Now, before I talk about the, the distribution concept for the collector, I, I should talk about the distribution concept for open telemetry in general. So just before the session, I was having a conversation with Eric, uh, and he mentioned that um, the, co the topic of distribution was, um, was uh, so he was part of a conversation yesterday that mentioned distributions. And I thought it would be a good idea just to say, what is a distribution in the context of open telemetry? So for open telemetry, a distribution is a collection of components that are assembled in a package, making it easier to accomplish a specific task. So for instance, when we are talking about SDKs, there are some vendors that provide a, a, a distribution of the SDK, of the open telemetry SDK, making it easier for users of that vendor to send data to said vendor, right? So to that specific vendor. Now, um, another way of seeing a distribution is when we apply that that idea to the collector. So a distribution for the collector is a collection of components, receivers, processors, exporters, connectors, and so on, assembled in a specific binary so that we can accomplish uh, specific goals, right? So a distribution, again, uh, is a collection of components. And we have two of those uh, distributions in, as part of our official uh, deliverables. So the first one is the core distribution. And the core distribution are selected components geared towards interoperability with other open source projects. So when the open telemetry project started, we made a promise that we would be um, playing nicely with other uh, uh, tools in the, in, on an open source ecosystem like Jaeger, Prometheus, Zipkin, and so on. So those are part of the core, along with you know, our own OTLP receivers and exporters, and a few processors that we think that everyone should be using, like the batch processor. Now, Contrib, on the other hand, is everything under the sun, <laughs> including vendor-specific components. So we have a, a repository, a GitHub repository called Contrib, where anyone can just go uh, and propose a new component. And if it is a vendor component, we, we made a promise to accept all of the components to make a plain, uh, level playing field for all of the vendors. So even uh, very new vendors can, can have their components as part of the Contrib repository, and as a result, as part of the Contrib distribution as well. Now, um, <laughs> this is what, what we have as part of the core, right? So it's very lean, uh, pretty much, um, I think uh, I counted 20 something components here, perhaps a little bit more, perhaps a little bit less than that. So we have OTLP uh, receiver, OTLP exporter, Jaeger receiver and exporter and so on and so forth, but really lean. I mean, it's not a lot here. Now, as part of the contrib, <laughs> what we have in here is I listed only 15 receivers, 15 processors, and 15 exporters because otherwise the slide here will be cluttered. But then there are extra 60 other receivers as part of the contrib distribution, seven other processors, and 29 other exporters uh, as of a couple of weeks ago when I prepared those slides here. Perhaps there are even more today. Now, it's, I, I don't know about you, but um, I have a, a, a strange feeling when, I, when I'm running. Uh, components that I don't actually need on my production environment. So what if I just need one or two extra components to the core distribution? So perhaps I need only, I don't know, a, a Spanjo matrix processor and uh, perhaps one or, or, or uh, one or two more receivers um, to get data from, I don't know, my SQL, right? So um, should I use the contrib just because of that? And by using the contrib, having hundreds of components that I don't actually need now, the answer to that is custom distributions. So um, we, we, have, uh, we built a tool called the Open Telemetry Collector Builder that allows users to specify on a manifest file, specify on a configuration file, which are the components that should be based, uh, should be part of their distributions. All right, so a definition of the builder is this one here. So the Open Telemetry Collector Builder, OCB, is a command line interface tool that generates sources and binaries for Open Telemetry Collector distributions. Now, we don't have an official definition of Open Telemetry Collector, so that's why I'm quoting myself here. Um, I just realized when, when, when making these slides that we didn't actually have a definition of the builder. Uh, on the Open Telemetry Collector's uh, website. So I opened a PR to do that, but the PR has not been merged yet. Merged yet. So otherwise I would have placed the link in here. Um, so, but that's the definition. So that's the, the builder, that's OCB. Um, and the idea behind, the, uh, behind OCB is really to have, um, very, it's very simple. It should just point uh, in the manifest file, you should just point to the goal module that contains the component. 
Now, in the, in, in the contrib repository that we have, each component is a uh, Go module. So the only thing that we need is a Go mod definition. So for Go, uh, so for, for Go developers, it should be quite um, uh, familiar. You just specify what is the Go module name in this in, in the first case here, go.openparameter.io slash collector slash receiver slash OTLP receiver, and then a space and the version. Right, so V0730, this is typically a tag, a git tag on that specific repository. Now we're going to have a, a, a demo for that. So let me open my code editor. And what I have here is, um, let me show actually another example. Um, so this one here. So I'm here on, on the open telemetry, open telemetry collector releases, distributions, OTL call uh, um, directly. And in here, I can, sh um, I should be able to show you a manifest that we have there. So this is the actual manifest for the collector core. And we can see here all of the components that are listed in there. And um, just to show you that this is not useful only to the open telemetry collector folks, uh, this is a distribution that we have at Grafana. This is you know, not official. Uh, you should not be asking for support for this one here. Uh, this is more like a proof of concept to show that we can have a very lean distribution of the collector here as well. So what we can do with a, such a manifest is um, we can just run this command that I tested right before a, a few minutes ago. So let's try that out. Um, this is to build a, 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 a collector based on the same manifest that we have uh, as part of the OpenTelemetry core. And I can do the same with you know our Grafana um, specific sidecar distribution, and this build a collector in here as well. So if I if I uh, show you the size of this one here, so we, oops, let me show you, uh, so twenty one megabytes versus um, eighty nine megabytes, right? So and of course um, it acts just like a a distribution, so I can just then. Uh, minus minus config, uh, sidecar, and it is a, an open telemetry collector distribution, right? So it's just started the components that we need. Um, if we type in like minus minus help, uh, we can see, uh, you know, it is a collector that you are all familiar with. Um, so that was pretty much it. So the, the key takeaways um, that we have are, um, you know, the collector is available officially in only two distributions, the core and the contrib. Core has essential components suitable for a wide variety, variety of applications, whereas contrib has everything that is part of the open telemetry collector project as a whole. And custom distributions can be used for a more streamlined, like smaller or safer solution. And the builder can be used to generate custom distributions potentially with your own custom components. So perhaps you have a need for a custom processor. And uh, instead of having that code as part of the contrib, you can have it hosted on your own repository, and then you can have your own distribution incorporating your component. Um, so that's uh, pretty much it. And I think uh, I will give it back to you, Henrik, uh, so that we can have a panel discussion. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks for your uh, your presentation. And I, I noted a couple of questions from my end, so uh, so I will I will ask them in in few seconds during our panel discussion. So uh, by the way, I'm going to just drop uh, the QR code. Uh, so if you want to uh, have a, a, an access to uh, the the GitHub repo uh, that uh, uh, Jurassic was used in few few seconds ago, uh, so you have the QR code here. So don't forget to scan it. Um, and so you'll be able to take advantage of the builder. All right, so let's start the uh, Q&A after a short uh, uh, transition video. All right, uh, so first of all, thanks uh, for all, uh, all of you uh, to making the time to prepare at this presentation, so sometimes 15 minutes is a, is a challenge, uh, depending on how much you have uh, information you want to share, uh, and also doing demo in 15 minutes is, 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 a, is a challenge. But you did, you did an awesome job, and I, I really thanks for, for that. So just to, uh, as a recap, uh, so Eduardo talked about uh, logs, metrics, and traces, reminding uh, the very standard, uh, what it, the, the support of them, uh, and it was a way, a way of introducing and reminding the fact that through in bit, this version two is able to collect metrics, uh, traces, and logs, and then forward it to uh, an any observer back of, of the of the market. Uh, so it's similar to uh, Jurassic explaining the collector 
I would say that uh, Fluentbit is can also do some transformations on on the logs level, but pretty soon on 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 the metrics and traces as well. Um, on Mendy, Mendy had a, a, a presentation about automation. So uh, I really like the the, the concept of uh, self service automation. So I think that that's uh, I have questions about it, Mendy. By the way, uh, okay. so uh, and also you mentioned uh, and then at the end very briefly, and I was like, ah, I didn't have the time to note it. And an open source project. So uh, I also weren't going to ask questions about this one. And as for those who were connected uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, this uh, the last lightning talks was presented by Jurassi, explaining uh, the what is the open telemetry collector, uh, the various components involved, the various the various versions of the collector, the core and the and the contrib, and he explained us and walked through how you can build your own distro by enabling just few plugins, only the one that you need to avoid having a massive. Uh, uh, collector that has lots of components where you only need two of them it makes more sense to build it. Uh, so uh, I have noted a few questions. Uh, and again, for those who's connected, uh, if you have questions, don't forget to drop those questions. Uh, we will uh, take time to answer uh, to those questions. So first, to Eduardo. So Eduardo, you mentioned uh, um, uh, the, 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 the logs, metrics, and traces. And uh, I think from, from when I uh, started to use open telemetry and producing traces, my first reaction was, oh, um, I've been building logs uh, in, in, my, in my code, and sometimes the logs that we're producing were uh, mainly uh, built for traces, where I was just marking uh, start functions, end functions, just to then, from the log perspective, seeing the time, the timing. Do you think that with uh, the usage and the adoptions of traces, because traces has been there out there, but now uh, it's fully adopted by the market? Do you think that uh, it's going to be to uh, going to the, the way we produce logs will change over time with the with the, with this doesn't use no signals? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. Um... Maybe I can base my answer on the experience working with logs uh, in the past. Uh, we found when, when you're collecting data, you're always, you know, as I said, want to analyze data. And there is a shift where most of the analytics that you used to run where the data is getting stored is moving to the right, sorry, to the left of the pipeline where the data is being generated. And we found that in time, Developers sometimes turn off, uh, turn on specific verbose labels on applications that also, you know, it could be like extra traces that you might not need it, right? And sometimes we found that users send use useless information to be processed in the pipelines. So if you have an architecture where you are centralizing your data in an aggregator or collector, which is pretty much the same. Do you want to overload that collector or reader? Do you have a way to simplify the job that is being done here, right? And then we can start talking about edge processing, right? Or filtering out the data where the data is being generated. So answering your question, I think that it makes sense if you can do, instead of making your applications, ship the data directly to the collector or aggregator for traces, have an intermediate layer or agent, it could be Fluentbit or the collector on the node, where you can strip down and filter the data right away before the data goes out of the box. So I think that even for the uh, open telemetry collector or Fluentbit, there is a strong use case there. Actually, we are seeing that for logs and metrics right now. People are saying, oh, I'm using this metrics collector, I want to use Fluentbit, and I want to drop data that has certain levels or Right. Yeah, and, and also it's, it's it's a way of controlling basically the cost, and because at the end, you can produce as many data as you want, but then you will have to store it, and and then storage usually comes with a price. So that is a way of controlling. Uh, I mean, the data that you will have to deal with uh, in your storage for sure. Yeah. So uh, uh, okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I, I was I was I, there was another uh, questions. Um, uh, that you, you you briefly mentioned the standard for metrics or Prometheus, which is obviously out there since many years, and and uh, which is in fact a de facto standard today. And everyone is producing exporters by def by def default. Uh, there was open uh, metrics as well, and I think open metrics 
Um, I mean, that's again, that's my opinion, uh, which is not maybe uh, true for everything, but for everyone, uh, I think that um, open metrics has been so slowly being replacing with open telemetry since they're the support of uh, metrics. So um, that's why I was just noting. Do you think that open metrics is still actively uh, uh, used and, and on the market, or or you see that open metrics, open telemetry metrics, will be the the new standard for for that? Oof, um, I think that saying what will be the next standard, it's it's really hard because that depends on adoption of the companies. I don't know what companies will adopt. So when I say industry standards today. It's like I asked for AWS, I asked, for example, Google or Microsoft Cloud, you know, all of them. Hey, what are you using for metric handling? Oh, we're using Prometheus. For example, if you go to Google Cloud, they have the Google Ops agent, which is like a master agent for telemetry data. And it, it wraps FluentBit, uh, Open Telemetry, and, and Prometheus. So it tries to handle all of that by using different projects. So if you ask me what will be the next standard, yeah, potentially could be open telemetry metrics, but that will be dictated by companies adopting the technology, right? We can have a lot of specs, ideas, to-do lists, but yeah, I was talking about what is running in production today based on feedback from users and big users. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Makes sense. I think yeah, like you said, standards are great, but if nobody's using it, then it doesn't make sense to have a standard for sure. That's true. Yeah, there's actually in in for example, when I said yeah, what the standards say, okay, what is maybe I would change the word, right? It's not a standard. What people is mostly using in production today, right? So, but we have few telemetry data, right? So I think that telemetry data in terms of what technology people is pivoting next or what they are trying out. If you go to large corporations, they tend to move really, really slow. Any change on these kind of patterns, architectures, or protocols takes more than one year, two years. So cool. yeah, we will have to see. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks, Eduardo. Uh, do, by the way, uh, Jurassi or Mandy, do you have any questions to uh, for related to uh, Eduardo's presentation? I, oh, okay. I had one about the parsable pieces. Um, so you mentioned that was it's open source, right? Is that the parsable stuff? Is that in a place where like other vendors and projects can put their own sort of filters and stuff into that project for their new products? So it just pops in? Oh, yeah. Well, actually, Parsable is like a new project that is around. It's in a very okay. early state. And I always get my problem how to visualize data. And I always were using an external service or Elasti with Kibana. And to, oh, this is a Rust project. I can deploy locally. It's just with a container and it has a UI. It works. Yeah, I, I, I don't have more experience than that. So I will not say use all your production data into it because I, I never used it before. <laughs> um, not yet. So Mandy, Mandy, I have, a, I have, a, I have a questions to for you. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned cell service. And in fact, it's funny because Jurassic had the, almost the similar questions that I, I note the same question. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I mean, Jurassic, I will let you ask the, 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 our, our question. In that case. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, I think it was very insightful what you had there. And I was thinking, you know, so many things resonated with me. But um, what, I, what I thought was, um, when should companies start thinking about, or when do teams should start thinking about automating the self-service uh, of their platforms? So when when should this investment be made? Yeah. Uh, at which yeah. point should companies say, now it's a good time to start thinking about that and investing engineering time to build those tools? Yeah, you make a good point there. Like the, it's, it's actual work, right? So like it's going to take time and resources to produce these sorts of things in a way that other folks can ingest them. So looking at you know how long your sort of expert teams are spending in doing work for other folks that isn't contributing to their team's goals right so the example that we use is always with cloud cuz folks understand like yeah sometimes an organization puts somebody a gatekeeper in the way of just getting to the cloud um, but there's there's plenty of other things there if if your team is constantly being asked hey can you set this thing up for me hey can you pull these logs for me. Hey, can you do this? Can you do that? Or whatever. Anytime you feel compelled to like put a bunch of things behind a queue of tickets, like 
that's maybe a good sign of like starting to look at more self-service capabilities for whatever it is. There's plenty of folks who are still searching for self-service for common IT issues, for help desk kinds of issues. And then as we get into these more complex, especially microservices derived environments, like there's there's just so many other components that I put my application up on on its little shelf and it has its cozy little home, but then there's all this other stuff that it talks to that I don't necessarily have direct access to. And it's really helpful for your platform engineering team or your SRE team or your infrastructure operations team or whatever you're calling those folks to have in their arsenal a way of saying, hey, this is your project. This is what it looks like. Here are the commands or scripts or tools or whatever it is is gonna help you get data or logs or restarts or whatever it is. Um, and that it's a different point for, for everyone, depending on the size of the team that is doing that work. Like they may have more or less time to tackle that. But if you're feeling incredibly stressed about all of this extra stuff you're being asked to do for other people, that's a good good point that you're like, it's time to, to give these folks some of their own tools so they can sort of fish by themselves. Um, so uh, that, that was a, a, a great, so do you, for example, look at for example if someone is dropping the same tickets uh on and on and on and on say oh i, I always have that same request coming in yes. uh, doing the same uh task so maybe it's time to provide a self-service absolutely automation. so that's the approach All right yeah 100 percent. that's a really good one too right uh especially when we talk to, to it teams there's a lot of that right there's just a lot of things that are um requests for access or you know any kind of other um, one team does a lot of password resets because of the way their <laughs> hardware is. And it just kind of like, okay, what's well, time to, to fix that up for you? Cause you're spending four FTEs worth of time doing that. Um, but yeah, like, and there's, there's always an XKCD for this, but there's, there's one for this one. That's like the, how much time you're going to save is based on like how often you do a task and how long it takes to do that task. And you can, if you need numbers, right, you can actually calculate it out and say, okay, we're being asked to do this particular task 50 times a week. It takes 10 minutes each time. Here's the timing we're going to save by giving that to, to the, the users to like click the button and do it themselves. And you can actually work back from there if you want to have like an actual metric for it. Yeah, that's true. And um, I, I think there, uh, Jurassic, had you had a hard stop. Um, so maybe I, I don't know. just take advantage of... Uh, of asking the questions to you, uh, so then uh, you don't, we're not blocking you to uh, to move to another uh, uh, um, uh, meeting or something. Um, I have a hard stop at the top of this next hour, so not, not ah, eight ago, okay. so in, in 52 so, minutes. So, so I also so we're got confused by that. <laughs> so we're lucky because it's it's, it's the week of confusion. <laughs> this week is the week of confusion between the groups. <laughs> <laughs> so perfect, awesome. Uh, so maybe I, I will ask my last questions to uh, Mandy and if, if Eduardo. By the way, if you have any questions, uh, uh, don't you? You can uh, feel free to ask. Um, so my question, the last question to Mandy. At the end, you mentioned an open source project, and, yes. and I didn't have the time to note it, and uh, I didn't get uh, all the, uh, the the value of that open source project. So could you? Um, uh, make us dream and tell us about this project. Uh, uh, I'm very excited about it. Uh, yeah. And I, I want to have to look at it uh, for sure. Yeah. So uh, the project's called Rundeck. It's been around quite a while, actually. It was originally a sort of IT automation of, of that sort of uh, stuff. But um, it, the, the sort of generic term we use is runbook automation. So um, a lot of you know technical tasks you package them up into a single job and then you give people access to that job based on who they are and what their credentials are so um it's a whole platform to allow your expert teams to package up the stuff that they know and give it to everybody else who doesn't have to know all the details but needs to know hey i need to know these xyz things out of this platform but i don't have access i don't know how to do it whatever it is and they can just log into their Rundeck account and find their jobs and click those buttons and get the stuff back that they need. So there's an open source component of it. It's open core um, and it's it's in Java. So if anybody out there is a Java programmer looking for an open source project to like come on board um, and has a series of plugins for infrastructure providers and like other places for gathering up logs and looking at telemetry and pulling all that stuff into, into responses to the jobs for 
your engineers, your NOC engineers, uh, other SRE teams, whatever the case might be. So it's an additional layer on top of what you'd think about, like having like a directory of shell scripts on your jump box that would be like, run this dot sh or don't run this one dot sh underscore back or whatever the case might be for all that stuff. It's just a nicer way of putting all those things together. So maybe uh, what would be useful if you can uh, drop me uh, in the chat and our private chat yeah. the link, I will share it. Uh, That'd be great. Uh, so then people can have the name and and, and have the access to to the GitHub report. That would be great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I have uh, uh, maybe uh, Eduardo or Jurassic. Do you have any questions for Mandy? Nope. Actually, I have about the app. <laughs> yeah, the application. Yeah. Go ahead. I have a, I have just a comment. So it's a um, thank you, uh, Mandy, for the quote of the day. Um, I love that there is always an XKCD for that. Yeah, love that. Uh, so uh, I have uh, small questions for uh, for you, Rassi. Um And I was wondering, uh, is there like a, a policy? Uh, when you use um, a distro uh, in general, uh, from the community perspective, uh, do I need to? Uh, uh, so do I need? I'm going to add that and show it. So it's just sorry because I'm doing two things in the same time. Do I need to um, to respect, for example, if I'm building my own processor, um, do I need to make a commitment to? Uh, to uh, contribute back to the upstream or auto contrib, or there is no major rules. Uh, it, for example, if for example I'm a vendor uh, in the in the observatory space and I decide to do my own distro, uh, I do I do the vendor needs to make a commitment say oh, yes every all the work I'm doing on the processor or I don't know exporters I will put it back to the contrib. Um, that's a great question. Thank you for that. So there is no. So I, I, I guess I will start by saying I'm not a lawyer, um, but the, the short answer is probably that you know it's a Apache license. So whatever you you depend on, like the, the open time to core libraries that you depend on to build your processor, like the internal APIs, they are Apache license. So that means that um, it is um, there is no such requirement to provide back um, the code that you are building that that depends on us. So it is it is really possible for you to have your your component behind behind your your your, your walls or within your walls uh, inside your walls and um, build your own components there and just build your own distributions and use it internally or even distribute as a like closed source software. Of course, um, as an open source as someone that develops open source software, I would love to see. Um, useful components being uh, published in an open source way. It doesn't necessarily have to be the contrib because of the nature of the of the uh, builder. Things can be decentralized, right? So I think it's one of the beauty things about the builder is that I can have a processor hosted in my company's repository and have users, not only my users, but other users to consume those uh, components. But I still want to own the, the life cycle of that component. Right. So, of course, if you want to get help from the community, you'll very likely donate to, to the Open Telemetry Collector project, but you don't actually have to. So you have, you have the freedom to do basically whatever you need. Close source it uh, or open source on your own repository or uh, donate it back to the community. Okay. That's uh, and and the other one uh, question is, uh, so you, you mentioned the, the builder, so it's a command line. And uh, the immediately, immediately uh, thought about uh, if I'm a corporate organization, I want to build my own collector. Uh, I will probably going to run it into a, a pipeline solution like GitLab or or Jenkins or, or whatever uh, uh, CI solution of the market. Um, so um, and immediately I thought, hey, maybe it will be make sense uh, to match to those uh, solutions on the market to have a, a Docker instance that has uh, the command line included. So then I can just uh, rely on that uh, uh, Docker image to uh, easily build my, uh, the, the, my, my uh, collector. Uh, is there already a Docker instance uh, of the OCB or is it something that our community has to build it by, by, by themselves? So there isn't. 
um, but uh, we, so it's funny because we have something that is very similar to what you mentioned. So we have uh, one of the repositories that I've, that I've shown is the Grafana slash uh, open telemetry collector components. And that is one example of, of building components or building distributions outside of open telemetry. So that was the purpose of showing that. And uh, if you open the, the automation for that, like the dot GitHub uh, directory and the workflows, and you, you see that uh, we download the latest OCB from the releases page of the open telemetry collector repository and we build distributions based on that so we don't actually have a docker container for that i think it is in the works someone in the community is working on on providing um debian rpm and apk packages plus the docker image or docker container or the container image for ocb but it doesn't it shouldn't prevent you from from already doing that so from already doing integrating building your distributions via CI already. And in fact, if you look at the repository that I mentioned under the Grafana um, um, namespace at GitHub, um, you see that I've built a lot of automation there to bump the open telemetry collector versions whenever there is a new version of the collector, right? So uh, you don't actually have to actively track if the collector had a new version. Uh, you just see you know, a, a pull request on your repository whenever there is a new version. Um, so, you know, th things can be automated in a, in a very nice way so that you f don't fall behind too much on on the, the target APIs for the collector core. And that, that's uh, that's answered pretty well my question. Thanks. And the other one is that you, when I looked at the, the, the way you build, so you, you're referring to Go modules. And I was thinking, oh, I want to do some security scan. So I can do it once I have my uh, collector builds. I can basically do a, a generate a scan out of it. Or sometimes there is tooling that I want to inspect the code. Um, so is there, uh, do you have a, a recommendation on how organizations should run their uh, security checks uh, on the various components that you want to add in your distro? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there are some, some users in the community that expressed the need for having the full source code for the distribution is stored internally for compliance purposes, for reproducibility and so on. So we have an option to generate the sources of a distribution. So you don't actually have to compile the distribution. You can just generate the sources for it. And um, the, the, the wrapper code is, is very simple. It's like a couple of Go files. But then the real treasure is in running like Go mod vendor, which will then just get all of the sources for all of the dependencies. And you can store the resulting uh, build directory in your source code repository so that you can track every single change that happens in your distribution, uh, even in the downstream, uh, downstream um, dependencies. So of course, then it's a it, it's somewhat of a work to go and find all of the license files within all of the dependencies so that you can have a, a, a manifest. Perhaps a specific repository uh, has different licenses depending on the directory, so it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but uh, generating the source of your distribution is possible, and for companies that need that type of traceability, that type of, um, of visibility into what's going on, they they are encouraged to store uh, their entire source code in, in a source code repository. All right, so that's uh, very clear. Thanks. Um, Mandy, Eduardo, do you have any, any questions to Jurassi? Nope. Yeah, Jurassi, I got one quick question because uh, this question was for me and I didn't have the answer, I got the same concern. Uh, from open telemetry, are you seeing some um, concerns around fragmentation in the ecosystem when you start having different distributions? It happened to us in the past with FluentD because we have different images with different connectors and maintain that at scale was uh, really complex. We are, we, are, we, are, we are concerned about that at the GC level, at the governing committee. Uh, we don't want distributions to, to fragment the, 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 the ecosystem. Um, at the same time, we do not want to restrict what is useful and what is not useful. So. Um, I would, as, a, as an open telemetry governing board member, I would love to see vendors to only provide things on their distributions that provide real value to the users um, that cannot be provided upstream, right? Um, if, if they're building things like extensions that are suitable for other users, I would urge those vendors to, to contribute back. Like, um, it, we were coming, so open telemetry is, a, is an answer to a situation that we had before where people would 
would be locked into solutions. So they would have to pay a lot of money, either engineering time or actual money to move away from, from proprietary instrumentation to open telemetry. And we do not want them to get locked in again because of custom distributions. So we want um, um, SDKs to be uh, interchangeable, and we do not want we do not we do not have a compatibility program yet or a conformance program, compliance program. We don't have that yet. We don't we haven't seen the need, so we don't actually have this problem yet. But uh, I think we are all aware that we do not want to go into this path. Uh, but it is a it real is a risk. Real it is a real yeah. concern for the future. Yes. Yeah, mostly from the vendor side, I think, right. So, because vendor can push out a distribution, but then if the user wants to move to a different direction, change the distribution, and things might not face the same experience, right? This yeah. is not open yeah. to thing, right? It's a vendor thing, right? Absolutely. So that's um, the good thing is, <laughs> um, pretty much all of the vendors or all the relevant vendors are they are um, represented at open telemetry at different levels so some people at the, at the board some some maintainers uh, of the like the .NET SDK or the Java SDK and so on and so forth so we are all interested in not locking users in, in into specific to specific vendors because that doesn't help anyone right so let's compete on on the best storage, the best uh, visualization, the best analysis tool, yeah. and not on the collection, not on on the on the instrumentation side. That's that's commodity. I, I think we are all agree on that. And the companies, the few companies that don't see that, um, or didn't see that in the past, they see it now, and and they are really struggling to catch up uh, because they don't have like the street creds for that. Um, but I think it is very clear that. Um, um, SDKs or instrumentation and, and a collection is commodity today. That's not where locking happens. Yeah, that's true. I agree. Thank you. I fully agree. Do you have any uh, other last questions? Uh, nope. Nobody? All right. So um, I would like to thank you, all of you, uh, Jurassi, Mandy, Eduardo, uh, for taking the time today to uh, be part of this live stream. Uh, I think it was, I mean, I, I personally enjoyed uh, your three presentations. So thanks thanks so much for the, the investments of building uh, those, this content and be part of that, of that event. All right, so uh, I will, uh, uh, we will, again, I will promote the video because uh, it's gonna be out there. Uh, so uh, uh, we can share it to, to, our, to, our, to our community uh, from our end. Thanks. And I will just uh, briefly conclude uh, this event. Uh, so uh, thanks and uh, see you soon. Uh, and thanks for your your, uh, your your investment. Yeah, thanks, Henry. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right, so thanks so much uh, for watching this uh, uh, second edition of the Observable Lighting Talk. So we had lots of great uh, topics uh, uh, from the collector perspective, from uh, Friend Bit, the support of metrics and logs and traces, and uh, the the uh, self-service uh, summation. I think that was a very excited uh, also presentation. So if you don't have the time to watch uh, lively the content, don't worry. Uh, the video will be available on YouTube, so you can still watch it at your own pace and enjoy the diverse content. So if you enjoy today's content, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. So see you soon for another Observable Lightning Talks.